up? Ao family, what's up? What's going on? Happy Saturday. Good morning to everybody. Uh, this is Brian Clayton back at you this month to answer your questions. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know who I am, I am CEO, co-founder of a company called GreenPal, which is the Uber for lawn mowing app that is nationwide in the United States. Before that, I had a landscaping business that I grew to eight figures and sold it uh, in 2013. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, answering everybody's questions this month. Let's get into it. Eric Blandino asks the first question, do I need and what are the pros and cons of having both personal and business credit as a business owner and how should I use credit to my benefit? A little bit of background. I haven't owned a credit card since 1998. I have bootstrapped my business from the beginning. I needed to buy a new vehicle, equipment, materials, coaching, or invest in a new team member. I need to make sales and save. I don't have the money and I can't afford the mentality uh, that I was raised with. At what point do I, at what point in the entrepreneurial journey is credit recommended to grow a business? How does one utilize credit for growth? We are currently $400,000 a year. What are the perks uh, that I could benefit from a credit card or, or lines of credit? Uh, rent exclusion service. Uh, we're in the business of giving people their homes back from the invasion of rats. All right. Love the business because uh, I used to have a service business, so I, I can relate to what you're saying. So about uh, first, let's answer the first part of the question. Uh, should I have business credit or personal credit? It's been my experience uh, building two businesses to over $10 million a year in revenue. As the owner uh, you're going to be personally on the hook for any credit that, that you take on. Um, now there's, there's other guys that will tell you differently that you can, uh, you know, figure out ways to not be personally liable, but I have never found that, found those ways. <laughs> you know, every credit card, every, uh, line of credit, every, uh, 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 vendor that I did business with, I was personally on the hook. So it's been my view and my experience, there's no difference between business credit and personal credit, especially at the $400,000 a year in gross revenue level. It's basically your credit. Um, there might be uh, credit cards in your business's name, but you're still personally on the hook. So I really wouldn't worry too much about the personal versus business. I mean, if, if you get a credit card for your business, I would get it in your business's name. Uh, under your business's EIN number, but you're still personally going to sign for that. Uh, so just for what it's worth, know that there's almost no difference between business credit and personal credit at the level of business that you're at right now. Now, once you start getting, you know, you know a few million dollars a year in revenue, maybe you can get some credit cards where you're not personally liable, but I've never gotten one of those. And, and, I've, and I've gotten millions of dollars in, in credit and loans and, and things of that sort, but I was still personally liable. So that's the first piece of the question. Um, the second is, when should you look to take on debt uh, versus not? You know, there's different philosophies on this. I, as an as, as a operator, uh, I lean more towards like the Dave Ramsey style of, of business finance, which is try to go as much debt free as you can. You know, let's say you say you need to buy a new truck, you know, rather than going out and taking out a lease on a, on a new vehicle or, or spending, you know, 50, 60, 70 K on a vehicle, I would try to save up 20 K and buy a good, a good truck and pay for it cash. And let me tell you why. My first uh, business was a landscaping company that I grew to 150 employees, $10 million a year in annual revenue. And one day I decided I wanted to sell the business and it took me two years to sell the company. And as I was selling the business, um, I began to learn something that everybody else in my industry wanted to sell their business, but they maybe had a million or two or $3 million business. But guess what? They also had a million or two or $3 million in debt, debt on equipment, debt on vehicles, debt on lines of credit. And so I think, and so they couldn't sell their business. And in fact, their business was a, was a chain around their neck because they had, they had so much debt. Uh, and so that's scary. Like that can, that can make your business become a, uh, 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 a negative thing in your life rather than a positive. So I would be very careful. I would be scared of debt and I, and I wouldn't take on any debt unless um, I knew I could pay it back in like 90 days. Uh, and, and, I, and I had a real clear cut plan on how to do that. Uh, the other thing is that debt and lines of credit can paper over or mask things that are wrong with your business. A lot of times small business owners will 
uh, say, well, I can't make payroll and the bank is going to give me a $75,000 line of credit because they're so nice. I guess I'll just go get that 75K and make payroll. When in fact, um, you should probably take a, you know, take a Sunday and, and, and maybe even have a, a CPA or somebody help you go through your business's books and figure out why am I not making money? Why can't I make payroll? And, and, uh, and, and try to diagnose what's wrong with the business. So short answer to your question, I would be scared of debt, especially at the, at, at the small business level. I, I would not use debt until, you know, maybe two or $3 million a year in revenue. And, and I, and I, and I had a real clear path to how to pay that, that loan back quickly. Um, and, and I wouldn't worry too much about uh, personal versus business car, uh, credit cards or, 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 or debt. Um, I would get a business credit card because, quite frankly, it makes operating a business easier. Uh, you can give your employees one and they can buy certain things. And so I would do that, but I would just pay it off every month. Next question is from Rohit Gupta. How do I determine prices for my products? Pricing is hard. Uh, this is a great question. So how do I determine pricing for my products? Background, we are in a exotic snacks and drinks business. We sell snacks and drinks from around the world. For example, Fanta from Japan or China. Right now we are in e-commerce and we are getting a brick and mortar store in December. Our products range from five cents to $15. I'm sorry, 50 cents to $15. To cover rent, utility, set up for brick and mortar store, does it make sense to increase prices or keep them where they are? Well, the first thing I would do, rather than uh, doing like a bottom up versus like, okay, well, what does the product cost me? What are my expenses? Uh, you know, what 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 is uh, what does my overhead look like? How much margin do I have to put? What percent do I have to put on that product just to break even? Like, you should know that. Um, let's say, let's say your gross sales are hundred K a month. Um, and, and, uh, what, what percent do you have to put on top of your costs of goods sold to recover all of your, uh, overhead rent expenses, insurance, employees, uh, things of that sort. So you, so you should know that it's not that hard. Just you know, literally just pen and paper, just, just figure it out. But before you did that, I would, you know, if I had a brick and mortar store, I would, uh, shop my competition. What's the competition charging for, for these products? Because it may inform that you can charge a little more, or it may inform that, hey, I can't carry this product line because I'll, I'll, I'll lose money on every, every unit that I sell. Uh, there's a great book called uh, Made in America. It's the, it's the Sam Walton story. I recommend you read that book. And if you don't like to read, just listen to it on Audible. Sam Walton, one thing that he was really good at was going to other people's stores, his competitor's stores, and just like with his little notepad and would write down what they were charging. This is back in the 50s or 60s. And then he would figure out if he could compete in those product lines or not. And he would also get ideas for like how they would arrange their end caps and how they would put like high margin products at eye level and low margin products at, you know, at your feet and things like that. So he was... Uh, shameless about shopping his competitors and figuring out what their pricing was and figuring out what their strategies were and then improving upon those things to make his business better. And so uh, a lot of times in, in small business, we think that's kind of uh, taboo. It's not the, you know, the best in the business. I mean, hell, Amazon does it, you know, uh, the best, in, the best operators in business shop their competition to figure out pricing, to figure out strategies around how to sell product. And so I would recommend doing that too. So start with a bottom up approach. What does it cost you to do business? What kind of margin do you have to uh, put on top of uh, your products in terms of percentage to recover your overhead? And then what kind of profit margin do you need to, to make the business worthwhile? I would do that first. And then I would look at what my competitors are charging and compare those two and figure out my pricing based on that. Next question from John ba Baptiste. Uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan John Baptiste. Love that name. I think we've talked on the phone. How do I determine what type of life insurance I should have? I am a residential real estate agent. I am looking to maximize my money for my future investment. I hear life insurance is a way, but I'm not sure what type would work for me. Do you view life insur insurance as an investment vehicle? How do you view it? 
and I don't know if it's appropriate for me. Okay, uh, this, is an, this is a pretty easy one. Um, I, I would not look at life insurance as an investment vehicle. It's probably one of the worst investment vehicles you could make. I think you're talking about maybe whole life or something like that. Um, I would stay away from that. I would just buy straight up like term life insurance uh, for the amount of life insurance I needed for my dependents to be okay if I died. That's what life insurance is for. That's it. Nothing more. It's not an investment in vehicle. There are so many other things you can put your money in. Probably like courses for yourself, training for yourself, uh, better systems in your business. Uh, if not that, then just a Vanguard index fund. Uh, are much better investment vehicles than life insurance. So it sounds like maybe an insurance agent is pitching you on uh, a life insurance policy as an investment vehicle. I would run away. Uh, buy life insurance, but only the amount you need for your dependents to be okay if, heaven forbid, something happened to you and you don't leave them with a bunch of debt around your business or expenses to bury you or, or if your income was gone you know, how are they going to uh, sustain themselves? That's what life insurance is for. You know, I, I don't know how much you need, 500K, million, 5 million, but whatever that number is, I would buy the term life insurance for that. And that's it. As far as investments, life insurance is not an investment. Run away from that. Next question, Kimberly Benjamin, how do I determine direct pricing versus wholesale prices? As a hairstylist, uh, products retail direct. I, oh, I retail products direct to clients and there are products I purchase at wholesale that I would like to turn around and wholesale to other stylists for them to sell. How do I determine what the margin should be for me so I can make money selling it to their clients, but also make a margin. My advantage is I can buy at higher volumes and get better pricing from wholesalers than they can get. Uh, this is similar to a previous question. I would, I would put myself in my customer's shoes. Okay, let's say there is a specific type of uh, styling product that they can't get anywhere else. Or maybe they can. Uh, can they get it anywhere else? What can they buy it for? I would try to price competitive with where they can buy it from other places. Um, if they can't get it anywhere else, then, then I would maybe bottom up it and say, okay, well, uh, you know, I, I, it's $1,000 uh, to, to buy a, a pallet of this stuff. I can break it off and sell it in hundred hundred dollar chunks. Uh, twenty percent is is a good rule of thumb, you know. If you mark it up twenty or thirty percent, uh, but I would more back into it with where can else can they buy it, and I would try to be uh, in line or maybe a little more, uh, maybe a little higher than that, but make it up in service. Like, hey, yeah, you can order it from Amazon or you can order it from this website, but it takes a month to get. I can get it to you in 24 hours. I'm a little more expensive. Um, I would try to make up some margin in, in service to, to them um, versus trying to undercut everybody else. Uh, so that's how I would look at it. My guess is, is that they could buy this stuff somewhere else. Uh, I can't imagine you, that the only place they could possibly get the product is from you. If they can, try to price competitive where else they can buy it from. Because if you try to, if you try to, you know, if you if you uh, kill the golden goose, so to speak, and try to overcharge them, and then they find out they can buy it somewhere else cheaper, they're going to have a bad taste in their mouth and not want to do business with you. And so, and so these days, I would price competitively with everybody else, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, but I would let the market determine that pricing. Last question from Roselli Aluke. Akluke. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. How can I become more comfortable networking with wealthy individuals? I own a full service accounting firm and we can help small business owners with all of their accounting needs. As I am networking in the community, I have been invited to places I feel like a fish out of water due to my financial status uh, of people that are attending. I would like to overcome imposter syndrome and feel like I belong. That's a good question. I have felt the same way before. Uh, it's, you know, the only way you're going to overcome that is just to continue to do challenging things. And what I mean by that is, uh, continuing to invest in yourself, continuing to accomplish, uh, milestones in your business, um, and continuing to, to become, you know, if there's a big gap between where they're at in life and where they, where, where you're at, closing that gap. 
And so, for instance, I used to have a, a landscaping business, and uh, I, I would work for really wealthy people. And and as I picked up one or two of these people as clients, I would put them on this pedestal and feel like uh, that I didn't deserve to even be in a conversation with them about about their landscaping needs. As crazy as that sounds, and as time went on, as I got more and more of these customers, I realized. They're actually no smarter than me. Uh, they're actually, in fact, some of them were quite dumb, but they were very wealthy because they, they own successful businesses. And so in a way, it became inspiring to me once I uh, hung out with them more and more and more to understand that they're no smarter than me. They're no different than me. The only difference between them and most everybody else is that they actually took a chance and took a risk and worked really hard on one idea for a long time. And so in a way, it can become inspiring. Once you spend more time with people who are super successful and you see they're no different than you are, it can really help you level up. So if you can look at it from that way um, and and just do do more of it. Uh, the other thing is, is, as far as networking, it's not, it's not who you know, it's what you've built. And so, uh, you know, what have you built? You've, you've built a, a CPA firm that, that can help people end to end with their accounting needs. And, and so what is the evidence behind that? Maybe, maybe you've got a blog, maybe you've got the best blog in your town that you're writing about uh, the, the questions that people are asking you and the business owners that, that, are, that are asking you questions. Um, you know, and, and maybe you, uh, you're developing evidence around the fact that you are an expert at this, at this sort of domain. You know, could be that you do a lot of books for, for dentists. And so like, here are the top 10 things that dentists that make over a million dollars a year do right in their business and you create a piece of content around that um if you invest in in assets like that that show okay look at what i've built um look at the evidence around who i am it helps you overcome that imposter syndrome because it's not like hey i'm not just somebody who's out here uh blowing smoke look i have an accounting firm i have this this blog with all of this research that i've done so the more hard things that you do and the more investment that you make in yourself um, and, and the more of these people you start to meet and do business with, the more and more you get to over, overcome uh, that, that imposter syndrome. Great questions this month, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I had a, had a blast uh, getting in the trenches with you guys just for a minute. If anybody wants to reach out to me, hit me up on Instagram, Brian M. Clayton. Just drop me a DM there. And look forward to answering you guys' questions next month. Peace.